CEO of this company is named Don Blankenship, or the ex-CEO of this company. Don Blankenship, for 30 years, did whatever Don Blankenship wanted to do. Don Blankenship uh, controlled local politics in West Virginia. He contributed three and a half million dollars to a candidate that no one had ever heard of for Supreme Court in the state of West Virginia. That candidate won. Too much across this country is going on just like that. So it's a fallacy, in my opinion, that workers have an unfettered right to belong to a union. Because people like Don Blankenship will say to the wives, to family members, and the minors, vote for the union. I'll show you a lot of union minds that are closed. He broke every labor law imaginable for 30 years. He broke all the environmental laws that you could think of. The worst environmental disaster before the Gulf disaster occurred at one of his mines when he dumped millions and millions of gallons of sludge into the water system. Didn't care about labor laws, never cared about environmental laws, never cared about health and safety laws. He ran southern West Virginia like a dictator. He hated me, and I came close to hating him. But if there was any justice in America, the U.S. Marshals and the FBI would have gone to his house when this occurred put him in handcuffs and leg irons and took his ass to jail. I know I'm not supposed to use those kind of words, but you are amongst coal miners here today. And I'll try to clean up my act as we go, or maybe not. Um, Don Blankenship, said at the beginning of this, I want a public hearing because I want everybody to know how innocent I am. I want to testify. All my underlings want to testify. I want to report to you today that Don Blankenship and every single person right under him who was subpoenaed to testify failed to do so, taking the Fifth Amendment. That doesn't make them guilty. That's part of our legal system. But you don't go out in public and say, I'm ready to testify, and then you don't. They took the position of Massey. This is not our fault. Of course, nothing's ever been Massey's fault, ever. This is the government's fault. Now, that makes a lot of sense to you, I'm sure. But they have taken that position. And you can talk to anyone at the Department of Labor, anyone at IMSHA. They have attorneys stationed at the mine. If you ask for a document, the government asks for a document, you got to sign for it, and then they decide if they give it to you or not. They're not down in Charleston. They're at the coal mine up on the hill. You can't even get cell service there. You've got to drive 25 miles to get, use a cell phone. But they have put those attorneys there. They have hired the best PR people, the best firm in America on the conservative side. The person who used to be the spokesman for George Bush is now speaking for Massey. But that's where we are in America with the way workers are getting treated. Well, we should not be surprised by this. I recall reading about miners and how they were treated before the union came about. 
before we had any laws to give workers a right to organize or workers a right to have a safe and healthful workplace or a right to join a union. Back in those days, about 1890, the most expensive piece of equipment in the mines was a mule. Miners were charged with taking care of that mule. Boss would come up, shake his finger at that miner and say, let me tell you something. Don't you put that mule under any bad top. Don't you get our mule hurt. Miner would say, what about me? What about me? Boss would look at the miner and say, we can hire another man. We got to buy that mule. And I wonder if at Massey that thinking ever changed. Quite frankly, it has changed in most mining companies, but not there. The laws, as I have testified in Congress repeatedly, are not for the people who obey the laws and want to do the right thing. They're for that 5% who disobey the laws don't care about their workers, treat their workers like dogs. In the United States of America, we can do better than that. We don't need those people in business. <laughs> what can we do to make things better? You need to empower the workers. You cannot go out on the street. Don Blankenship couldn't walk up to any of you and say, stand in front of that bus right there for me. I want to see you get hit. Uh, jump out on the railroad tracks. I want to watch this. You would say what? No, I'm not doing that. What happens when he's in control of your family? When he's in control of your income? when he's in control of everything in southern West Virginia. We should not have two sets of laws here. One when you're not at work and one when you're at work. Individuals need to be empowered. Many of you may not know this, but Eleanor Roosevelt went into a coal mine in Ohio in the 30s. When she came out, the press said, uh, Madam First Lady, how can we make the mines safer? She said there's only two ways to make these mines safer. One is legislation. Two is unionization. Now that's what Eleanor Roosevelt said. She was right. Now there's been talk today about, well I think when you have big tragedies like this, Terrible tragedies, that's when you get laws passed. That's not necessarily true. 1907, the worst industrial accident in the history of this country occurred in a coal mine when 362 miners lost their lives. You know what legislation was passed then? Nothing. The first piece of legislation that was passed to uh, protect coal miners wasn't passed until 1969. All the union tried and tried and tried. After a terrible tragedy in Illinois, John L. Lewis testified in Congress in 1952, I believe it was. Over 100 people were killed in the mines out there. You had all these witnesses lined up, the CEOs, the presidents of all the coal companies, the most powerful people on earth. Back in those days, no television. When you had the newsreels, you had a radio and the newspapers, all packed into this hearing room. The chairman said, I want everyone to introduce themselves. So you started down here, and you had the CEO of Consol, Peabody, Allen Creek, on and on and on. They got to the end. John L. Lewis looked a little out of place there. 
he stood up, cleared his voice, never said, I'm the president of the United Mine Workers. He thought for a moment for effect. He was a Shakespearean actor, by the way. <laughs> True. He said, uh, Mr. Chairman, my name is John Lewis. I represent those miners who are still alive and sat down. That was the most effective testimony that day. Johnny L. Lewis making the point, the point that was the union standing up for those miners who still had a life to live. I want to submit to you that there was another woman who gave us some instruction too. You know, there's people talk about John L. Lewis and all the men in this movement, and, and we're proud of that. But you know, we had a lady that, well, she didn't like being called a lady. <laughs> Mother Jones said something to the effect that I am no lady. <laughs> to, uh, the rich aristocrats, aristocrats, excuse me, made ladies, but God Almighty made women. The women in here seem to like that. But she said the following, pray for the dead and fight like hell for the living. Now, thinking about what Eleanor Roosevelt said, that you got two ways to protect workers. One is legislation. The other is unionization. So I submit to you that no worker anywhere in this country, I don't care if he's a coal miner or an auto worker, a steel worker, or a public employee, no worker should have to listen to the boss say, I want you to do A, B, and C, and it's dangerous. Every worker should be empowered to look that boss in the eye and without fear of losing their job or a cut in pay and say to that boss, kiss my ass. <laughs> but you know, I just want to submit something to you. You know, we are a, a wonderful country. Government of the people, and by the people, and for the people. Sometimes we forget who the people are. I submit to you are the nurses that healed the nation. Uh, we are the construction workers that built the nation. We're the police officers that protected the nation. We're the firefighters that rescued the nation. We're the coal miners that energized the nation. The American labor movement, we are the people. Now, if you want a better America, I can tell you how to get it. If you want higher wages, join a union. If you want more health care, join a union. If you want a voice at work, join a union. If you want more protection, join a union. If you want a greater America, join a union. And you can't get that by simply talking about it. You gotta be about the business of marching. I gotta submit to you that Gandhi marched, Martin Luther King marched, John L. Lewis uh, marched, Mother Jones marched, Moses marched. Moses didn't send Pharaoh an email. <laughs> Never sent Pharaoh a fax. Moses went to see Pharaoh. We should come together in the spirit of Wisconsin and Indiana and Ohio. This land is our land. We will stand and fight for what is right and take back our country from those who have stolen it from us. United we stand, divided we fall. A wrong to one is a wrong to all. Thank you and God bless all of you.